Hi everyone, I have a very cool question for you today and today we're gonna learn the squeeze theorem and integration by parts. So for the most part of this question, we're just gonna be playing around with integrals and uh, but at the very end, we're gonna have to use a little bit of this thing called as squeeze theorem. I'll explain what that is and how we can use that in this question. So let's get started. This is the problem number A3 from the Putnam exam in the year 2011. And in this video, we're going to be talking about integration by parts. What's this limits and squeeze theorem? You know, how do we deal with this? Then obviously we have book sessions for college mathematics and at the end, a similar challenging problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical Olympiads, physics Olympiads, computer science and informatics Olympiads, ISI CMI entrances and research projects for school and college students. Okay, so I want you to find a real number C and positive number L for which the limit as R tends to infinity of this weird looking expression is actually equal to L. Right, so find a real number C and positive number L. So just we need to find just one such pair. Okay, this is fascinating. So um, I think first, let me just discuss the squeeze theorem. It's something that's very obvious, you know. Squeeze theorem, right? It's something which may seem very obvious to you. So let's say we have this function g of x and g of x is bounded between h of x and f of x. Right? It looks something like this. You can think of it like the function g of x is squeezed between h and f. You know, like a sandwich. It's also that's why this is also the sandwich theorem. You know, squeeze theorem on the sandwich theorem. Now, if this happens, so if this happens, and we know that let's say limit as x tends to a of h of x is equal to limit as x tends to a of f of x, and let that be equal to L. So that implies that limit as x tends to a of g of x will also be equal to l. So it's something that is very intuitive, something that seems very obvious. And um, yeah, it's, it has some pretty cool applications, you know, some non-standard limits, you know, which cannot be usually solved by the Hopital and stuff. They can very easily be done by the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem. And they're usually fairly easy to spot. But for the purpose of our question, we're only going to need this at the very end. So we'll save our discussion till then. Okay. Now, now the first thing when I see this problem is it reminds of this inequality. So we know that sine x is less than or equal to one, right? But it's also greater than or equal to this linear function two by pi times x. And this can be very easily proved that this belongs, uh, that this works for all x between zero to pi by two. Right. And the reason I chose this zero to pi by two is because if you see the limits of this integration are between zero and pi by two, right, for both the numerator and the denominator. So I think that's a good starting step. Right. And you can really check this very easily. So for instance, we have, we have, let's say this graph. So this is how the sine function looks like right? the sinusoidal curve, the x axis is the y axis. And let's say this is the line y is equal to one. So this becomes one. And obviously the sine achieves one at pi by two. And then you would have this line, which is basically y is equal to two by pi times x. It's like a linear function, right? So from this graph, you can very clearly see that this inequality holds true. Now if I multiply by x is to the power r, so we will have x is per r over here and we will have two by pi times x is per r plus one. The reason I multiplied by x is per r because we get x is per r times sine x, which is similar to what we need in the numerator, right? Now, if I just integrate this, so this just becomes two by pi, x is per r plus one dx is less than or equal to integral x is per r sine x dx is less than or equal to integral x is per r dx and limits obviously zero to pi by two. So we get a form that is actually, you know, similar to the numerator. And at this point, I'm going to use certain notations. I'm just going to call this thing as a sub r. So basically, if you evaluate this, you will get a sub r is between two by pi times x is per r plus two divided by r plus two limits, obviously from zero to pi over two. 
and this is less than or equal to x is for r plus 1 divided by r plus 1 again the limits from 0 to pi over 2 okay that's amazing so what do we actually get over here we get a fascinating inequality so 1 by r plus 2 times pi by 2 raised per r plus 1 if you just plug in the limits this is less than equal to ar which is less than equal to 1 by r plus 1 times pi by 2 raised per r plus 1 and i'm just going to label that as number one result number one right so we have sorted out the numerator in a way if you actually just realize um ar is basically the numerator this entire thing is ar right the thing underlined in blue is ar a sub r now we have this denominator as well over here and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to call the denominator as br b sub r essentially the denominator right integral from 0 to pi over 2 of x is per r times cosine x dx and it so happens that this can be dealt with via integration by parts so if you remember integration by parts integral u dv was nothing but uv minus integral v du now here's the fascinating thing u is the first function right and we choose the first function by the eilate rule so inverse trig logarithmic algebraic trigonometric and exponential so here we have an algebraic and a trigonometric function so we should naturally take the first function as x is per r and whatever is remaining dv is essentially cosine x dx now if you try to apply this du becomes r times x is per r minus 1 and v obviously becomes sine x um, so basically when you uh, when you apply this formula you get br is equal to something like x is per r sine x minus integral from 0 to pi over 2 of r times x is per r minus 1 sine x dx so this is very ugly you know it's not helping us right if you actually think about this this is not going to lead you anywhere you can play around with this but this is not at all very helpful so what i'm going to do i'm going to use the non-natural substitution right so here we took the first function as x is per r but what i'm going to do is i'm going to take the first function as the trigonometric part so cosine x which is fascinating you know hardly ever you will see this ILA tool getting broken this is one of the rare cases where the ILA tool does not work right you have to take in contrary to the ILA tool it goes directly against that so dv is whatever it's left it's x is per r dx du then obviously becomes negative sine x dx and dv obviously becomes integral of that 1 by r plus 1 x is to the power r plus 1 if we just plug this into the formula the br becomes uv so cosine x times x is per r plus 1 divided by r plus 1 from 0 to pi over 2 minus integral v du so that just becomes 1 over r plus 1 x is per r plus 1 sine x dx and this might also look very bad but i'm going to tell you that is actually very good because if you actually notice this entire thing becomes zero because cosine pi by 2 is zero and 0 raised per anything is 0. So when you subtract it, it becomes 0. So BR effectively becomes 0 plus 1 by R plus 1 times this integral from 0 to pi over 2 x is per R plus 1 sine x dx. And if you notice something, this is nothing but A sub R plus 1, which is, which is great, honestly. BR is A sub R plus 1 divided by R plus 1. That's a fascinating relation that we've got. But essentially, we need to compute something that looks like this, right? We need to compute um, L is limit as R tends to infinity, R is for C, A R by B R. This is our goal, right? This is what we want to accomplish at the end of the day. So we're going to move a little bit, you know, slowly and steadily towards our goal. So we've computed B R. So what is 1 by B R? 1 by B R will be nothing but R plus 1 divided by A sub R plus 1 right as simple as that now from equation number one i know that ar was bounded between two intervals in a way right we i'm just directly copying equation number one or result number one this was one by r plus two pi by two raised per r plus one and the upper limit we had one by r plus one times pi by two raised per r plus one now what would be a r plus one so we're basically replacing r with r plus one right so r is just going to be replaced with r plus 1. So what will you get? You will get 1 by r plus 3 times pi by 2 
raised to the power r plus 2 and on the upper limit you'll get 1 by r plus 2 times pi by 2 raised to the power r plus 2 so what would be 1 by a r plus 1 because essentially we need this uh, a r plus 1 denominator right so when you take its multiplicative inverse the upper limit becomes the lower limit the upper limit becomes lower limit and lower limit becomes the upper limit the sign of the inequality essentially swaps in a way so basically we would have r plus 2 times 2 by pi raised to the power r plus 2 over here and over here you would have r plus 3 times 2 by pi raised to the power r plus 2 fascinating now if i multiply this by r plus 1 so on, on all sides i'll get r plus 1 r plus 2 times 2 by pi raised to the power r plus 2 and over here i'll get r plus 1 r plus 3 times 2 by pi raised to the power r plus 2 and this is amazing because this is nothing but 1 by br if you remember right this is 1 by br fascinating so 1 by br is essentially bounded like this r plus 1 r plus 2 times 2 by pi raised to the power r plus 2 right and over here we have r plus 1 r plus 3 times 2 by pi raised to the power r plus 2 amazing i'm going to call that equation number 2 now again just to remind you equation number 1 we had some bounding of ar equation number 2 we have or result number 2 we have some bounding of 1 by br our goal was to find the limit as r tends to infinity of x is r is for c so we have something like this right ar divided by br so what i'm going to do if you remember in equation number one we had ar and in number two we had one by br so what i'm just going to do is i'm just going to multiply these two equations so because when i multiply this in the middle i'll get ar by br and then i'm going to have obviously these a bounding of ar by br and that's going to be such that this becomes r plus one times two by pi you can just compute this multiply out the uh, lower bounds and the upper bound this just becomes 2 by pi and over here it becomes r plus 3 times 2 by pi so basically you just compute this you know multiply out the uh, inequalities okay now then now i'm just going to multiply by r raised per c because that's what we need right so r is per c times ar by br this just becomes r raised per c times r plus 1 times 2 over pi and this is less than equal to r is per c times r plus 3 times 2 over pi now then now then now then i'll remind you of the squeeze theorem this is where we use the squeeze theorem so basically basically we need to find the limit as r tends to infinity of r raised per c times ar by br so that it exists okay it exists the limit exists now the limit would exist if and only if by a squeeze theorem limit as r tends to infinity of this lower limit r raised per c times r plus 1 times 2 over pi should be equal to limit as r tends to infinity of the upper limit basically this r raised per c times what r, r plus 3 yeah times 2 over pi so essentially what i'm trying to say is when these two limits are equal and they are let's say equal to l so obviously the middle one will also be equal to l right so if this limit is equal to l and if this limit is also equal to l then this limit will also be equal to l via the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem essentially right so my question then reduces to when is this uh, when are these limits equal so for what value of c essentially so for what value of c is limit as r tends to infinity of r raised per c r plus 1 times 2 over pi is equal to limit as r tends to infinity of r raised per c times r plus 3 times 2 over pi so what for what value of c does this hold true and the answer to that is actually very simple so if you just consider c is equal to negative 1 c is equal to negative 1 we have limit as r tends to infinity of r is for negative 1 times r plus 1 times 2 over pi 
which is nothing but um, r plus 1 by r times 2 over pi. So basically we have limit as r tends to infinity of 1 by 1 plus 1 by r times 2 over pi, which is by elementary calculus nothing but 2 over pi. You get L over is equal to 2 over pi. And similarly, if you consider this, you would get limit as r tends to infinity. C is obviously minus 1, so r is for minus 1 times um, r plus 3, 2 over pi. So limit as r tends to infinity, you would get r plus 3 by r times 2 over pi and again kind of like using the same logic this just becomes nothing but 1 plus 3 by r times 2 over pi if r tends to infinity 3 by r will tend to 0 so this will be simply 2 over pi so even here l is equal to 2 over pi if you see both of these are equal to one another and therefore the middle one will also be equal to the same thing 2 over pi so therefore we had to calculate c and l right so c is minus 1 and the limit is 2 over pi and that is our solution it was a pretty cool problem uh we used quite a lot of stuff there you know non-standard uh integration by parts which is very fascinating something that we don't really see that often and obviously at the end we had this beautiful concept of the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem so i hope you really like that okay so moving on your certain book sessions so college mathematics introduction to analysis Principles of Mathematical Analysis by Rudin, Calculus Volume 1 and Volume 2 by Apostle, Topology, Contemporary Abstract Algebra by Galen, Topics in Algebra by Hurstein, Abstract Algebra, Domit and Furt, Linear Algebra done right by Axler. So at the end we have a similar challenging problem and I wanted to evaluate this limit. This is probably easier than the problem that we've done right now of course, but uh, still a little bit tricky nonetheless. So maybe try it out and if you're able to do it, let me know. Until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Sinta programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics. And they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training, individual evaluation, and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR and IISC. For more information, visit Chinta.com.